How are you? Mr. Vincenzo Guzzo, how are you doing? I'm all right, yourself? I'm good. Did I did, did I pronounce your name okay? Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Awesome, awesome. If you're okay, we'll go. Like, it's very conversational. Uh, yes, some sure. Might call me, some might call me super animated. I move my hands and stuff. A, what are you, Italian? Lot. Italians move their hands like that all the time. He, well, I'm East Indian, but I'll tell you about a, 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 a small Italian connection. I, I don't know if I got it from there. Maybe you picked it up. It's a, You know, it's one of the... You know, you pick up greatness sometimes, right? You hang around with enough, uh, you know, I, that's the way it is. <laughs> I love it, I love it. REC Experience presents Real Estate Entrepreneurship Leadership with your host, Jazz Takar. The REC Experience Podcast is now on air. Hey, 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 thanks for being in the REC Experience. I'm your host, Jazz Takar. And for my viewers, you see someone next to me. For my listeners, you guys are in for a massive treat. I have a dragon on with me today. Well, a a dragon from Dragon's Den, that is. Mr. Vincenzo Guzzo, how are you doing today? I'm all right. Yourself? I'm good. I'm good. Um, You know, for the first week of this lockdown, at the time of this recording, I was saying I'm good, like considering what, what what we're all dealing with. But I have to say it's been... Coming up, to, coming up to a little bit over three weeks now, and, and my 25 years of experience in sales and service and learning from leaders like yourself, um, I got to go back into my toolbox and just remind myself that, look, there's so much to be grateful for. There's so much opportunity. Like, you know, I say it all the time to my viewers and listeners, guys, gals, opportunities everywhere. You just need to get in the way of it. And if there's anyone that is going to be able to share not only their, your story, your successes and your failures, um, I'm so glad to have you on because you've done so much. You've been through so much. Um, for my viewers and listeners who are maybe under a rock or something and they haven't heard your name yet um, and they don't know your story, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, you know, I'm the, I'm the movie guy, right? I'm the guy that... Uh started off uh, with uh, uh, one theater and, and, you know, gradually beat up on, uh, on the old famous players in the old Cineplex and, and made a room for himself. And then um, we opened up the market. And from that, I went into the real estate business. I went into the construction business. And now I'm in the restaurant business as well. I'm in the t-shirt business, cap business, medical business. So I'm all over the place. I'm actually, you know, my, my father says to me, you know, why don't you spread yourself a little more thin while we're at it? You know, just go right ahead. Just spread all over the place. Um, and so um, because of the, uh, it was really funny because I was actually, uh, I was in New York State on holidays and somebody said to me from Sony, that um, he looked at me and he said to me, he says, you know, I, I've been looking at you from, you know, that table down there. And I says, okay. He says, you look like quite a character. And I said, I don't know where you're getting that from, you know, but anyway, okay. He goes, you ever think about being on TV? I said, excuse me? You ever think about being on TV? And I says, who are you? So he gave me his card and I noticed it was from Sony. And I said, buddy, I'm in the movie business. I own movie theaters. I'm behind, not the guy, not behind the camera, behind that guy. You know, like, I'm really behind. So, I mean, so I'm not convinced I'm going to go on TV. That was about 10 years ago. Okay. And so one thing led to another. And then finally, you know, they came calling, uh, Dragon's End came calling. And I said, you know what, uh, let's meet up, you know. And so I sat down with the execs and it was the funniest experience in the world because we were sitting in, a, in one of my restaurants talking, having fun. And um, Tracy, who's the um, um, head executive producer there, says to me, she says, can you reproduce this? Re- reproduce what? Can you reproduce how you are here in front of a camera? I don't know what, why you're saying reproduce. This is who I am. I don't know who else you think I can be, but I'm not an actor. I go, it's the opposite. I can be a non-scripted guy. I can't be scripted. Like, give me the hell alone type of thing, right? <laughs> and so, you know, as I, as I debuted two years ago on Dragon's Den, I think, you know, people got to realize that, um, you know, I, I, you know, why I am the way I am and why I take, some space, you know, I'm like, uh, like an elephant in a China shop. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, and, and I believe that, um, you know, um, it's, it's, uh, you know, you said it, I, I think, you know, we're at a crossroads. Every crisis brings us at a crossroad, right? And uh, there's two things I say often in the last, uh, so you've been in quarantine for three weeks. 
I've officially been in quarantine for four weeks in Montreal, but I was in quarantine two weeks earlier uh, in New York State, where I have a home there, and basically I, uh, I quarantined myself. I was sick, and so okay. I said to myself, I'm going to go quarantine myself there. I'm not going to go to London and Paris on the spring break trip I had planned with the kids on a rugby tour and so forth. And I just, you know, went to the house and I, and I quarantined myself there. When I was feeling better, I said, okay, let me go back home now. And uh, now that I'm back home, I can, uh, uh, you know, look at running my business. And then I was told by everybody, no, you don't have a business. Theaters are going to get shut down. You know, so as of this date, you're shutting down the theaters and we don't want to know anything about it. And that's what it is. And so the first thing I started telling people, uh, especially from my industry, guys who were panicking and they were saying, oh, my God, like theaters have not, you know, people have to realize movie theaters have never been shut down so massively like we've done. it. OK, in other words, you have every single theater in the world shut down. That's never happened before. The last time we had something like this was in 69 when we had the Hong Kong flu. Some uh, uh, sporadic areas would shut down for a period of time and then reopen and so forth. And in the 20s, when we had the Spanish flu, that's where the first time ever theaters started getting closed by municipal governments. But never a state or a federal government has ever shut down theaters. So everybody's panicking. And the thing I tell everybody all the time is this, I tell them all the time, I say, nothing great ever comes from panic. And everybody just looks at me and says, well, what do you mean? Well, you're panicking. So you know it's gonna go bad if you're panicking. So stop panicking. It doesn't give you anything to panic, right? Sit down, look at the math, try and see where you can re-pivot your business, right? So we opened a, uh, a, a, a streaming platform that we, it's more, of a, it's more of a video store online. That's okay. what I like to call it. Yeah. Because I really believe that uh, subscription model will change in the okay. next few months to years. What do you mean? In other words, why I think, do you say that? Why do you say well, that, Vince? Like, okay, I'll tell you why I think it's going to change. Because look at how many people have lost their jobs temporarily and need to make all of those calls to stop those automatic withdrawals from their accounts, right? So I have a feeling a lot of people are gonna say, you know what, and, and, and I already know what the answer is, right? So you call up the, the, the credit card and you say, I'd like to stop these five transactions, right? And their first reaction is gonna say, have you called the merchant? You right. say, yeah, I have, but it's three hours. I've been waiting on the phone and nobody's answering me, right? He says, well, you have to call the merchant. So at that point, you're probably screaming and yelling and say, just cancel my goddamn card, right? right. It, and so, in my mind, people will say, you know what, from now on, I want to pay as you go system. So if I want to see something, I'll pay for it. If I want to do something, I'll pay for it. But I don't want to pay you regularly and I forget about it, right? Just right. so you know, I mean, one of the things I did, right, once half of my theaters are owned by me, the real estate, and the other half isn't. I'm on, I, I lease. Okay. On the half that I lease, Every one of them gets paid by check, right? So they normally want automatic withdrawal and everything. And I said, I'm not going to do that. You're going to get a check every month and so on. So you can understand that when April 1st comes along and I sent them a letter saying, I'm not paying you the rent. Based on these conditions in my lease, I don't have to pay you the rent. Meaning right. you, you promised to deliver me a premises where I can run a movie theater. Running a movie theater is now illegal until we get out of this lockdown so i don't have to pay your rent leave me alone now you want to take the two months three months that were shut down add it to the back end of the lease so that we extend the lease i'm all right. for it 100 percent. I'll, I'll play right. along with that game but when it came to some of my real estate mortgages i called up my guys and i said call up my bank and put stop payments on all of the all of the payments and let's talk to people and so all of my real estate, all of my, all of my mortgage guys make deals with me. So what I basically did is I told them, look, let's suspend the capital repayments, but I'll pay you the interest. Okay. Some of them said yes. And some of them were surprised and says, no, but we'll just accrue the interest. It's okay. I mean, I don't want to pay you the capital because I want to impact less my, my cash flow, but I'm not, right. I still have money. You're like, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm still gonna pay you the interest. I don't want to. And some of them actually made a deal where I would, 
pay them the interest, but I already have a deal that when we reopen the theaters, whatever the, uh, call it, let's say, let's say the original loan was a $20 million loan, and now I'm at 15 million. So right. the minute we reopen, we kick it back up to 20 million and we restart the whole loan and so, you know, so as if I'm renewing and so forth. So, forth. so for me, it's a great way of, I'll pay the interest and then I'll recapitalize myself on my own properties and so forth. So what's funny though is that two of the guys that I did a deal with mm -hmm. called me up or their, their accounts receivable guys called me up on April 1st or April 2nd saying, your payment didn't go through. I says, which payment? Well, well, you know, your mortgage payment. Yeah, the, the one that I stopped payment that I'm not supposed to be giving you. It's the interest payment. Right. Well, how are you supposed to pay the interest? You're going to send me a bill and I'll write you a check so I can control who's taking money, right? So for those reasons, I'm telling you that I think the whole just automatic debits out of accounts, you know, auto, it's going to start changing. People are going to say, you know what? I want to keep my money. <laughs> I want it's control. just like a gym membership, like a gym membership, right. right? You put it in, you forget about it. Half the, like more than maybe half the people never go That's back right. February 1st after they got the subscription. But it's true because I've been telling like, so I'm in the real estate business. So I help yeah. people invest into real estate, residential, commercial here in Toronto. And, and I had some people call me and said, look, I lost my job. Um, but can we start thinking about real estate? And I go, just before we do that, can we just talk about your foundation, for example, like for a second, like let's think about your expenses. Let's make sure you can eat and you have a roof over yeah. your head. We'll get into investing later. Let's, let's yeah. put that on the side. And I think the first thing you should do, and I, I told my clients is start to look at those Netflix bills. Let's look yeah. at those Hulus and the Amazon Primes and all the stuff that you were buying monthly subscriptions to that you thought were ten ninety nine, but then they start to compound and it adds yeah. up, right? And not only that, right? The big problem is that where a lot of people have a hard time is when you sign up to something, the monthly renewal is at that date. But then you signed up to something a week later. That renewal is yeah. at a different date, right? So now you're paying... $10 this week, and you say, okay, it's 10 bucks. And then you don't realize you're paying another 10 bucks next week, <laughs> but it's still just 10 bucks. And then you realize, it's, and all of a sudden you realize it's 60 bucks, right? Like, I mean, a lot of people, what, what's interesting in all of this is that it gives us a lot of time, right? So the biggest concern people have, or actually I shouldn't say people have, but you know, the, 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 the theater haters, let's call them like that. They're all saying it's over. Right. This this right. is what this is what we needed. This is the, the last nail that we need. To, it's over. Movie theaters are gone. Like they're, they're not gonna. And I sit there and I tell myself, if one thing is gonna happen is there's gonna be some first time baby booms, right? So mm -hmm. people who don't have kids may end up having kids in nine months. People yeah, who do have kids. People who have kids, they're not going to have a second one in nine months. Trust me, because they probably want to strangle somebody by now. I but, have two. I have two. We're, right, we're so good. you're not looking for a three, right? Three's we're not good. happening right now. That's right. We're good. So I got a five, right? So six ain't happening. Trust wow. me. Wow. Right? Congratulations. So, yeah. so the truth of the matter is that as a, as a society, we now have to adapt. And I think if anything's going to happen, this is what's going to happen. This is my guess for the future. Okay. So what am I doing? I'm planning already to accelerate the amount of restaurants I'm going to open. Instead of opening one every 12 months, I'm going to open one every three months. Why? Because I suspect that people are going to be confined for the next another four weeks. And then they're going to want to kill somebody and say, I'm getting out of here. I just want to leave. I, I just, I need to socialize and whatever. Right. You have to remember that the biggest problem that many, many uh, uh, heads of states or leaders have is that we, we have a disconnect with people. And that is, you know, I have people tell me, why wow, it's amazing, you know, like I got this uh, home theater system. It's a, they seem to forget that the average person doesn't have a home theater system, right? And so at the end of the day, you know, I have a banker, uh, one of my bankers who, who just got married and she lives in a 580 square foot apartment with her boyfriend or now husband, right? So I tell myself, what kind of home theater system can you have in 580 square feet, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, and yeah. so 
she, she was telling me, she says, I never realized how small my apartment is until I had to be confined to it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This thing's puny. I, I need a bigger place, right? <laughs> and that's the reaction that you're going to get. So people are going to want to socialize more. So anything that had to do, so any, any, any drop in socialization that was created by social media, by texting people and so forth, a lot of those sectors are going to get hurt because people will say, screw the text messaging, screw the screens, screw all, I want to go see people. And, and going to the theaters, what's amazing about it is that you can be socially inept and go to a theater and be with 400 people in an auditorium and not deal with anybody. But hey, you socialize with 400 people because you laughed with them, you cried with them and so forth. For fun. sure. And then the other thing is that I believe it was on, um, I think it was on Arlene uh, Dickinson's um, social, uh, uh, Instagram account uh, she posted something and I reposted it. And it was something like, uh, you know, three weeks in, okay, I'm done with Netflix. What else can I watch? Right? Because the truth of the matter is that, is that it's not an experience to watch TV or it is, but it's TV at the end of the day. Right? So right. I always like to tease people when, especially when it's, you know, women uh, interviewers, they always like to tell me, well, you know, why would people go to the movies versus you know, stay at home and watch it on TV. And I, and I usually, you know, it's a, little, it's a little macho of me, but I usually say, you know, coming from a, from a woman, I'm surprised. I mean, TV is inches. I talk in feet. Come on, size does matter. Everybody knows that. Come on, like, hey. And so... And there's, the something the to the whining and, and there's something to the whining and dining experience. Well, that's you know? right. I mean, I mean, yeah. I always look at it this way, right? The... The, the banker, it's really funny because the bankers that always had a hard time understanding if there was a future to the movie business, today are the ones telling me, hey, now I understand what you mean. Yeah, like, you're not going to get, you're not going to close yourself up or close your wife up in a house 24 hours a day, seven days a week, come back from work and say, oh, I just want to watch TV. She goes, you know, I want to kill you because I need to go out. I need to socialize. I need to see things, right? Especially so, after us going through this time now, right? Especially yeah. the, the, the last four weeks, six weeks for yourself. Like, I think for the next decade, we are going to, this is going to be imprinted in us yeah. that the next time we say, hey, let's just stay home. It's like, remember that time in April of 2020? Like, you know what I mean? Oh, like, yeah, let's yeah, go yeah. get out. Yeah. See, so look, there's going to be a, a few changes, right? One of the changes is, so first of all, you, you know, the, the other, uh, another quote I, I'm saying a lot these days to journalists because they're driving me crazy, asking me what I would say sometimes to be really dumb questions. In other words, you know, like yeah, seriously, yeah, yeah. like yeah, you really yeah, want yeah. to know what, you know, for example, I have, I have a, a newspaper in, in, you know, the Journal de Montréal, one, okay. um, one of the journalists there who's a, um, who actually was the head of the movie commission okay. at a certain point. Uh, two weeks ago decided to just shit all over movie theaters and how it was the end of the end and so forth and so forth and so forth, right? So he asked me a question. I really let him have it. And I said, you know, the problem with you guys is you really have bad timing. I go, you know, what nobody remembers, and, 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 and it's funny that I say nobody remembers because it's a question of resilience, right? So humanity has a resilience that, that we forget. It's because we forget that we're so yes. resilient. In other words, if we were to remember absolutely every horrible thing that ever happened to us, we would be locked up in a white room with a body strap and we could not function. So our body and our mind has a way to repress stuff. And so I tell journalists, I give it a month. And the average person will forget all of this and say, I want to hear about it. I don't want to become a germaphobe because the just problem like, is. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, because yeah. the problem is that everybody. So we always have this issue, right? We always hear the vocal minority and we forget that there's a silent majority. So okay. right now, you know, I got an email from a guy and I called him up. It was funny because, you know, every once in a while I get these complaints and I decide to call up. I go, it's too long to write to you. I'll just call you. <laughs> And so the guy says to me, he says, 
now that you know this has happened, are you finally gonna put Perel bottles at every door and so forth over so them? So I called him up and I said, Tell me something. Are you Jewish? And he says, No. Why are you asking me that? No, it's because I'm curious, because you want me to put a Perel bottle on every door. What do you think? It's a mezuzah? I put it on every door? I mean, it's a joke or what? Like, what are you talking yeah, about? What? Yeah. He goes to me. He goes, no, but, you know, because, you know, we want people to wash their hands and everything. I go, buddy, if you've become a germaphobe, don't come to theater. Like, you're dreaming in colors, buddy. Stay home. Like, don't come. And he goes, yeah, because, you know, I go to the bathroom and you know how many times I go to the bathroom and people don't wash their hands? And what, you think I'm going to put a Perel bottle and they're going to change, it's going to change their habits? <laughs> yeah, it's not my yeah. fault that people, you know, don't have the civic-minded responsibility of washing their hands after going to the bathroom, right? So, right? so the whole point is that, will we be more careful? Yeah, I mean, obviously we're not going to, but are we going to stop living? No, in fact, I tell you that because this was a virus that killed so many people and it's still going to kill a lot more, it will actually trigger the opposite. It, it, it'll trigger life's too short, life's too precious for me to invest in putting money aside for my retirement. I may never get to my retirement, right? So I, so I want to live it up. And I want, so you're actually going to get, I believe, a huge boost in the recreational business. I totally Movie theaters agree. will go up. Restaurants will go up. Uh, out of the house will go up, right? Experiences. Everybody. Experiences getting outside the house. Like, I think, you know, most of my viewers and listeners are, are old enough to remember 9-11. And yeah. after 9-11 happened, everyone said the airline industry is done and, and, and there will be nobody working in, in hot, like skyscrapers. Like the, the construction of skyscrapers is going gonna, is gonna to be impacted significantly. Neither yeah. one of those things happen. We well, all not in that. Toronto, that's for sure, right? You go to Toronto, <laughs> there's more skyscrapers than, than before. Like, I don't get it, right? For so, sure. Yeah. We're, we're the concrete jungle here in that there sense, go. right? But, 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 but more people want it more. It, to your point, Vincenzo, like, like more people wanted to get out and say, you know what? Life is short. And the chances... Well, probably one of the safest places is going to be airports. People started to realize that because security got heightened so much that we all were like, let's get out. Let's go experience more. Let's go on vacation more because we don't know when it's going to all end. Right. And so to your That's point, right. and, have... and the truth of the matter is you can't let fear yeah. govern you. Right. I mean, what you got to do is you got to, I mean, you know, I always like to say you can use anxiety to help you, but you can't, um, you can't let it stop you, right? So, in fact, I, I, I'll, I'll go one step further. I always tell people, if it doesn't scare you, you're not doing anything that's significant. I mean, you got to scared. You got, and by scared is a big word, right? Scared in the sense of, can I fail? And if you can fail, it should be a deterrent. You know, and, and it should build some anxiety in you. And, you know, a lot of people don't realize that fear and anxiety is the same thing, right? It's just so. Right. And so I think these are incredible times. I think these are opportunities. There's, there's opportunity all over the place. I think local business will become important. I think where we will have a change in mindset is that reasoning of, I'm going to produce everything in China or in Turkey or somewhere else because it's cheaper. That 50 cents, that dollar cheaper may just not be worth it. Let me, let me do it here in Canada. Let me do it locally. Let me help my people in all intents and purposes, my citizens, you know, people. And, and, it's, a, and it's more of a circular uh, 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 economics that's going to happen. That's going to happen. I think, I think, you know, I think the made in China is going to have a severe problem. Uh, I think the made in Italy will have a huge boost because I think, you know, the, the empathy people will have for Italy. A lot of people need to realize that Italy is a victim of its tourism mm -hmm. and is a victim of, of, of and, and so is Canada. I mean, look, you know, uh, um, I said it on the 23rd of February. I, had, I was on a call with some government people and I said, guys, shut down the borders to tourists coming to us. 
I, I don't want I, like there's no reason for European tourists, Asian tourists to come to us in the middle of a potential pandemic that we're gonna yeah. that, that's triggered, right? I guess just so it's not a question of racism or anything. Just shut down the border, right? Keep them open towards the U.S. because psychologically you don't want to trap people. You want to give them an alternative, and the U.S. border is an easy alternative and so forth. And let people travel, uh, nor, nor, uh, you know, north to south and not east to west until we have it clear, the picture's clear. Um, I, was, I was told by some that I was an alarmist and I laughed and I said, me? It's me. <laughs> and you're calling me <laughs> an alarmist. I'm the exact go, okay. opposite of that. <laughs> yeah, I go, me, okay, no problem, whatever. Uh, and in fact, uh, the same people that called me an alarmist then said to me, but how irresponsible are you? You don't want to close theaters down. I said, look, guys, you're not getting it, are you? I said, you guys are keeping the liquor commissions open. You're keeping the pot stores open so I can get drunk and I can get stoned. But what do you do with the 15-year-olds? Mm. I mean, what are they going to do to get, you know, like sort of alleviate their stress? Right. Part of it is hormonal and part of it is the situation. Right. It took three days for our premier to go out on air and say, please, please keep your teenagers at home. Please, remember, you're the parents, you're the bosses. Put your foot down, keep them at home because we can't allow, right? And then everybody called me and said, okay, now I understand what you were saying. Yeah, guys, you gotta make the right calls at the right time. The other thing is, you know, it's not the time. Uh, I, I think as, as, uh, as business people, we need to be logical. It's not the time to waste time criticizing politicians. Like, honestly, I, 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 I agree. I mean, you know, did, did, was Trudeau doing the right thing by going to his country place this weekend or not? Well, it depends what, how you want to see it, right? Right. If, he locks himself down to the point that he looks like he's terrified. He scares me more. Uh, <laughs> if he Good looks, <laughs> right, if, you, if he's a bit like Boris, you know, or like, like Trump, now he's worrying me the other way. And I really, you know, <laughs> but I mean, at the end of the day, you got to respect a general who's willing to take the chance to go on the battlefield, right? Yes. So, and God knows I'm no liberal. So I, you know, I didn't vote liberal in the last election. So we're not, but it's not the time. 18 months from now, we'll have a post more them. We'll sit down and, and decide. One thing, is, one thing is clear that there is a certain, I guess, connection between politics and business. Remember, I was going to run for the leadership of the Conservative Party and people said, bah, business skills don't apply to politics. Eh, nah. well, yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you one I tell you one business skill that would have applied very clearly in Quebec. When I spoke to our premier in Quebec, I told him, I said, look, guys, it's a good idea to have an epidemiologist on your crisis team. So that's good. You did a good job. You ever think about putting a psychologist on it as well? And they looked at me and said, what do you mean? Well, because when you lock everybody down, there's going to be a few widows. Okay. Somebody's going to die. So we got to, you got to. And so, it took him a few weeks, and right. now everybody realized that what I meant is you got to be careful, right? So in other words, whether we like it or not, we have right now two different images. We have our premier in Quebec, who's cool, collected. He's a businessman. Uh, he talks to us from the heart. Sometimes the facts may be a little off, and so he has to correct himself later, but that's okay. I mean, he's a, he's a victim of who's feeding him the information, right? So sure. that's okay. But on the flip side, you know, I don't know if it's a smart thing to tell me that life's not going to go to normal for another 18 months, right? It's like, right. hey, wait up a minute. And so I would tell you that in my business right now, right, some people would say, well, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm probably in a gambling term. I'm probably doubling down. Said, what do you Why? mean? Why? Why? Yeah. Yes. Well, because the truth of the matter is, it is in times of crisis that the most opportunities appear. So for me to shut down my theaters, put everybody on 
uh, on I, uh, I, uh, on uh, employment insurance, on EI. EI, yeah. I, I don't know. Is, is, that, is that really what I am as an entrepreneur? Is that how I'm going to take care of my team? Versus what I did is I laid nobody off. And I said to everybody, we're going to tighten our belts and we're all going to work on a rotation basis and we're going to spring clean the theaters. As we're spring cleaning the theaters, we realize, well, what up? We clean, but you realize this is broken. Well, time to fix it. Let's get it fixed. Time to renovate this and so forth. So a lot of people tell me, they go, but, you know, it must be really boring for you. Are you crazy? I like got more work now than I did before because now <laughs> I'm planning new theaters. I'm renovating the older ones. I'm reinvesting in, the, in, the, in, in my business so that when we do open in two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, whatever it is, Whatever it is. Right? We're going to open with brand new theaters. We're going to open with, you know, oh, wow. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a, I invested, I refreshed the look. I, it's so that's what you do when you trust the business you're in. If you really think the business is going to die, then yeah, obviously you walk away. But right. I don't see that happening. In fact, I even told some of my real estate guys, I said, look, have a look where we have theaters. Have a look if anybody seems like they're about to choke and need to dump the property. Let's see if we can't buy the properties. Now, I mean, Vincenzo, Vincenzo was, was, like, I, I need to know this because was this, like, were you born with this in your DNA? Was this something that you learned? Was this because you, you, you surrounded yourself around people? Was this something that your parents instilled in you? Like, where did this come from? The fact that you said, I'm doubling down. And you said that with like a lot of ease, yeah. you know what I but, mean? But so I mean, the truth of the matter, look, I went, and I'll never forget this, because when I was invited to go speak at, to the University of Calgary, it was a little awkward, right? Because one of, the, one of the people inviting me was actually a professor in an entrepreneurship course. And so I felt that because, you know, I'm a big believer that you can't teach entrepreneurship. I, I, so you can give me the skills to be a mm -hmm. better entrepreneur, but you can't make me an entrepreneur. I either have it or I don't, right? And depending of how quickly I can develop skills, that's how quickly I can turn around and benefit, right? But can you, in other words, can you teach somebody to have vision? Can you teach somebody to have guts? Can you teach somebody to be, brave and you got to remember brave doesn't mean intelligent sometimes it means being foolish and you're brave right so it's true. Right, can you it's true. can you teach that now you know i've had a, a an advantage or a disadvantage call it whatever we want i mean i'm an only child for an okay. italian family that is insane very rare right? yes my father is an only child my okay. grandfather was an only child right so we're we're eight generations back we're, there's only one of us carrying the and wow. I'm the one who changed all of that, and I, and I got four boys and a girl. So, <laughs> so for sure, when you grow up alone in an, in, a, in an Italian community or an Italian neighborhood where everybody's got three, four older brothers, and sometimes you're, you know, elbows are going and fists are going, and you realize, Christ, I'm alone here, man. There's four of these guys. Like, I gotta, <laughs> yeah. It makes a difference on how right. you're going to approach life. You're going to approach like, okay, there's four of them. There's one of me over here. Either I, I have to annihilate everybody. So I, you know, so you, so for sure what happens is you develop a certain sense of extremism, right? So I've always, so I've always said, uh, I play hard, but I work even harder. In other words, it, there's no middle ground to the game, right? So, that's why for me, doubling down is actually being conservative because normally I should 10 times it down. You're like, ah. yeah, like throw more at it. Let's go. You know, like invest in it now type of thing. Right. Yeah. When things are good, I feel sometimes that they're too controlled. Right. Okay. When the economy, everything's booming, everything's great. Everybody, you know, everything's just on, on autopilot. I almost feel like, but the results are predetermined. Somebody's already divvied up the benefits. I don't want to play this game. When there's insecurity, 
now there's opportunity. Oh, when I love that. You know, and that's where people need to understand is that as an entrepreneur, you are a risk junkie. You are going for the risk because, and, and, and there's only so much, you know, there's only so much time you have to do that because then what happens is you sort of grow out of it. In other words, you start becoming more vulnerable in the sense, you know, your age and now, you know, like, you know, like I should be thinking of retirement. Right. And you go, so somebody called me up, you know, two weeks into this, this lockdown and said to me, so are you, are you still sane and normal? Oh, I'm okay. I said, you know, I, <laughs> what's interesting is I wasn't wrong. And he says, what do you mean? I wasn't wrong. Retirement sucks. I mean, like, I really don't want to retire. So, so I can guarantee you I'm working till the last day I can breathe. Because there's no way. I'm going, like, on the beach in Mexico to take walks, long walks. And I'm not taking no walks. Because we, we got to feel it now. We got oh, yeah, to yeah, feel yeah. a little bit. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, I want to do it. And so, you know, it's funny because I was talking to Molly from uh, Dragon's Den, who's one of the producers, and she says to yeah. me, what do you do differently? Yeah. But it's, it's really funny. I go, I mean, the only thing I do differently is I wake up much later. So you sleep more. No, I didn't say I sleep more. I said I wake up later. Yeah. yeah. What do you mean? I said, so before I said I would wake up at four in the morning. Right. By seven o'clock, everybody in my company had gotten at least three emails saying, I expect this done by 12. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. Now instead, I, I think I get up at seven thirty, eight o'clock. Yeah. By the time those emails go out, it's probably lunchtime. <laughs> yeah. right? so says, yeah. But but so you sleep in? No, I don't. I, you, you don't understand? I go. I wake up later because yeah. instead of going to bed at eleven or midnight, I now go to bed at two in the morning, two thirty, because I can't sleep. The yeah, day just anxious, got right? So I'm like sort of like yeah. Hey, I'm restless. Yeah. I got a the type of yeah. thing, right? Yeah. And I look at yeah. I look at the results in Europe and China yeah. at night. You know, I get the, and so <laughs> the truth of the matter is that I still get up, I still take a shower, I still try and shave, I still wear clothes as if I'm going to the office. That's the only important. Thing I you're been you're wearing, sticking to your routine. You're sticking yeah, to your. The only like thing someone. I haven't been wearing is my shirt. Like I don't got wear it. my shirt. You know, my long sleeve shirt with the cut. Yeah. And that's yeah. just because I don't want to hear my wife complaining. Why do I have to wash one of these again? Like, why does the nanny have to waste her time doing this? Like, you're not going to the office. Why are you wearing yeah. cufflinks for? Like, why, you know? Yeah. But or else, my pants are dress pants. You know, like, it's like, you never know. I said, what if, what if, I don't know, E.T., Entertainment Tonight comes and see me or somebody. Oh, I gotta look good, right? I can't. I'm on TV. Come on. It's like, yeah. And so the secret is, in these times, is... You got to stick it up. You got to keep the course. Whatever plans you had, they got to continue. You can, in fact, you know, some, some, somebody said to me once, why? You, you can modify them. Yeah, you can adjust them. And one of the adjustments I would advise you to do is accelerate them. Because you want to be ready at the end of this pandemic. You want to have your restaurant or your movie theater or your drive-in or whatever. You want it available immediately when somebody is going to be able to want to serve it and not six months later when some of the some of the pizzazz around it has sort of worn off right i mean right it was funny because somebody said to me you should have opened drive-ins and i yeah. and i send them an lol and i said you know i'll send you something just for the heck of it and it's one of my bankers and i okay. sent it to him and he and he looked and he said but but I don't understand. You never came to see us with this. So I had a project three years ago to open drive-ins on about 15 native reserves around the country. Okay. And the whole idea was it was my way of trying to get natives in their own community to, you know, sort of create a business that would make us go to their, go to the reserve and realize that, Hey, they're just like us. Like, there's no real barrier, right? We're, yeah. we're, it's a mental barrier that we put in, right? And that's where I realized that the reason why we didn't do it at the end is because we had a problem. The problem is that most Native reserves do not have the infrastructure or the sanitary services 
to accommodate, for example, a thousand cars. Because a thousand cars is like 2,000 people on average. Okay. Yeah. And therefore, 2,000 people, you would need a hell of a septic tank to try right. and handle a Saturday night. Okay? Sure. And so, and that's where it became part of, you know, my discussion platform with the conservative party and saying, guys, this makes no sense. Like, we have hundreds of thousands of people living in Canada, very close by the major centers, like the one, you know, we have a native reserve, uh, Kahnawake in, uh, in Montreal. It's yeah. literally stuck between one South Shore city and the island of Montreal. Like, it, it, th there's a road that goes from Montreal through Kahnawake into a South Shore suburb, okay? okay? And the services stop before getting to the reserve and at the other end. And say, but it, it's like a five-kilometer stretch. Why don't we just continue the tubing and, like, Right. Oh, well, no, it's because it's, it's, it's federal land. What do I care whose land it is? Pass the goddamn too. But everybody at the same standard of living. Right? Yes. These are the kind of stuff that we look at and we try and find what's, what's the new thing, right? And, and I'm telling you, I believe that socializing will become even more important. Why? Because okay. we've been told we're not allowed to. Right. So I always I always tell this to my wife when, you know, when she yells at the kids and tell them, don't do this. Don't do that. And I says, don't tell them that. The more you tell them, don't do it, the more they're going to want to do that. Find another way. Tell them, why are you doing that for? That doesn't look that fun. Why don't you do this instead? This looks this is smarter or whatever. You know, find a different way, because the minute you tell them, don't do that. Yeah, it's not going to work. Now, I look, I was the perfect bad boy boyfriend. <laughs> right? okay. And it was funny because I did this a few times. So I would meet the parents and so forth and so forth. And after a week or two, I would take the father aside and say, look, you're not understanding how this is going to work out. The oh. more you tell her she, that she doesn't have to be with me, the more she's going to fall in love. This is what my problem is. I don't want to be here longer than I have to be. I ain't going to get married with your daughter, okay? So let's try and play. Like, Endure herself for the next few months so I can move on. But it's please, pretty ballsy. Uh, yeah. Like, give me a free alone, okay? Like, and so you got to know human nature. And, and, and I think that, you know, the talent of entrepreneurs, and that's hard to teach, right, is how do you interpret the fact? How do you interpret humanity, right? Um, the last time I spoke to our premier and to his, some of his uh, crisis team, I said to them, let's get something clear. You do realize that if I open my movie theaters today, I lose money, right? And they said, well, what do you mean? Well, you realize I got no movies. You realize the U.S. is shut down. They're not going to give me a movie if it's not also available in the U.S. theaters. So all of those movies have been moved. So from now till about the middle of June, I got no real big movie, okay? But I still think we should open but I think we should open weekends only, Friday, Saturday, mm -hmm. Sunday. And I think what you're going to see is you're going to see some gradual opening like that. You're going to see people gradually going back to theaters, not really caring what they see, but more, I just want to, I just want to feel to normal again. Vincenzo, you put, if you put on Godfather... Uh, yeah. uh, on a Friday night, the thing's going to be jam-packed. Yeah. You know, you put some of the old school movies on, yeah. you're not going to have a problem with that. I That's mean, true. my wife my wife doesn't care about a lot of the, the old school movies, but she would now. She'd be like, let's go. Let's go yeah. for a glass of wine and, and, and kind of open that up. I want to take you back for a sec because you mentioned something and you, you were jokingly saying it about your father when he mentioned that, you know, why don't you spread yourself more thin? A lot of entrepreneurs hear that, okay, like only do one thing, Focus on that. I'm a true believer of have a lot of, like juggle a lot of balls because if you have 52 balls up in, this, in the air, yeah, my 12 might drop, but I, I'm still good. I still got 40 in the air kind of thing. And obviously you're living proof of that. But what would you say to somebody? Like how were you able to, to, to juggle so much? Well, look, it's very simple. The successful entrepreneurs, let's look at, you know, uh, whether we like Bill Gates or not, he's a successful entrepreneur. Whether we liked Steve Jobs, he was a tyrant. I knew the guy. 
but I loved the guy. I mean, in his craziness, he was amazing. Uh, Elon Musk, he's a nutcase. But look at the success stories and what do they all have in common? What they have in common is they focused on one primary major source generating, uh, uh, stimulation generating, satisfaction generating industry or company. And then we only discovered it later that they had tentacles all over the other place because what they were doing is spreading the risk of multiple revenue sources. They were actually being complementary in their behavior, right? So when we, when we started with the movie theaters and then we went into the construction business, it's because we were saying, well, wait up a minute. If I build the movie theater and I got to pay somebody else to build it, he's going to make a 30% cut. So I got to put up 25% of the money on that 30% cut plus on the, you know, so, so all of a sudden I was able to negotiate with some bankers and say, look, guys, I'm building it myself. I'm not going to take the, the general contractor's cut of 25, 30%. That's my put. That's my equity stake. So now you're going to finance me 100% of my construction. And the, and the guy said, hey, wait up a minute. You're building a theater for 55, 60% of what it normally costs. Well, yeah, because I'm not taking my, my profit, right? So, right? so all of a sudden, the construction business became a different source of revenue for us. It became a real estate play. But it's complementary to my movie business. It actually made my movie business better off and now, and, and so really quickly, Vincenzo, does the construction company build, and not to cut you off, I apologize, but does it do, like, does it build it anything builds else other, other than, it builds other than other stuff. Okay. It okay. builds other stuff apart from movie theaters, yeah. Okay. And, and then also owns, it also, also develops as a developer other properties, and, but the theater's almost always a complementary to that right. bigger development, right? Right. And then when we went into the restaurant business, it's because we said to ourselves, well, you know, you open a movie theater, every single mom and pop restaurant wants to open near you. There's got to be something here. And so we said, you know what, let's go into the restaurant business. It's complimentary, right? And so we went into the restaurant business. Then, you know, the problem with, with you know, we got into the medical research business by coincidence. In other okay. words, you know, we're investing through philanthropy in various researches, this, that, that. And one of the problems I've always had with, with research was, I didn't think it moved fast enough. I, I, I think the guys were complacent in their way sometimes. You know, it's like sort of, okay, I got my million dollars, and now just, you know, I, I'm good for 10 years, so I'm gonna coast for 10 years. So what I did is I said to them, okay, look, I'm not going to give you money anymore just like that. I'm gonna invest in the business. I'm gonna create a business. I will own 50% and all of the researching team will own the other 50. If you want money now, you better start giving me some results because I need to be able to monetize, right? And all right. of a sudden, everybody is now being educated that there's gotta be a performance analysis somewhere. Somebody's gotta be able to quantify what's going on, right? Accountability. So there has to be that some account there has to be some accountability, right? That's right. And, and that, because the biggest problem, and this was a joke, uh, it was said as a joke, but the guy was being honest. So we have, my, my wife's got a master's and she's got a PhD in uh, child psychology. More particularly that the field she had studied in was expressive writing. Could it be used to alleviate mental health issues due to anxiety and so forth? And so we invited one of the top, uh, uh, PhDs in that sector and I, we had dinner with him, we sat down we talked about all kinds of stuff and then my wife who thought she was going to throw him a, you know, I guess a compliment or something you know, he's an older guy in his 80s or whatever my wife's beautiful so you know I guess it was sort of her way of, says to him says that, you know by the way Dr. Pennebaker I bought every one of your books and the old man looked at her and he said seriously? She says, yeah every single one of them, seriously she goes yeah why don't you do that for you? Should have just bought the last one. I just add a paragraph every two, three years. I add a chapter, sorry, every two, three years. And then I republish the same thing. Okay. So I looked at him and I said, you do realize that that kind of attitude is what's turned off a lot of businessmen. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. But at 83, he goes, I'm done. I don't, I don't need you guys anymore, so I don't care. Right? And so he lives in Texas. He doesn't care. Right? And so that's where ultimately we need to do it all the time. First and foremost, we do it to ourselves. Right? We, we set guidelines. We set uh, uh, places where we want to achieve goals we want to achieve and 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 we and we set them i can tell you and this is a this is a message i guess to a lot of entrepreneurs young entrepreneurs if you're meeting your objectives it's because you haven't pushed them far out enough i tell you that i have never been able to meet any of my objectives never i've always in all intents and purposes in fact one of my sons said to me the other day said to me don't you ever get disappointed that you're always under your targets? Yeah, I guess. But the reality is that my real target was, let's say, a million bucks. Right. But then the team's target was five million bucks. So when we got the three and a half million, everybody's saying, shit, we're all going to get killed. He's going to get mad at us. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Man. And I walk in and I say, anyway, guys, you did your best. I guess we're going to have to find another way to get to where we want to get. Right? It is what it is. Originally, if I had just wanted to be complacent, there would have been a million bucks. Exactly. And I probably would have only got to a million bucks. I wouldn't got to three and a half million. So yeah. I actually, right? So you got to over dream. You got to over push, right? And, you know, to go back to your question, I don't know if you can teach that. Right. Right? I, because, I, because, and I see, look, I'll give you an example of a family that I know, you know, the Saputo family, you know, the cheese. Uh, okay. Yeah, so for sure, for sure. the old man, Lino Sr., he's the third son. Okay. Right? So if you base yourself on a family of that generation, that far back, normally the first son is the head of the family. Yeah. How did the third son do it? Right? It's because he just had it in him. And so he's the one who took the old man's business, the grandfather's business and made it exceptional, right? And so, and so sometimes it's just a question of temperament, of ability, of, of uh, connectivity, right. right? Can you, right? And, 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 sort of, and also probably a sense of entitlement, right? As the older, as the older son that's automatically entitled and you think you're going to be king, well, I'm king, uh, it's my birthright. Yeah, well, right. I might be a birthright, but I'm, I'm outdoing you on this one. So, and that's where it's always, you know, if you look at some of the greatest entrepreneurs usually come from not the richest place in the world. Very rarely do they come from, you know, the rich world. I, I wanted to get your thoughts on just real estate at a time like this. There's, right. there's some, a couple of other things. And I want to be very, very respectful of your time. Um, yeah. In terms of real estate, um, talk to, talk to our investors out there. Like, is this a time that you are, are still looking for opportunities like that double down kind of mentality? Are you also looking at it from a real estate perspective? Uh, so I would look at buying real estate that I have my theaters in, for example. Uh, I would probably wait a few more months on a buy other stuff, you know, like buy apartment building, stuff like that. Um, it, it's going to sound mean, but let somebody else ride the no revenue, no, no rental revenue wave. Let them I love be, that you said that because that's, you know, like be yeah. that's the advice that I've been giving to thousands yeah. of my clients over the yeah. last 15 years of been doing yeah. this, that, that just wait a couple of months. There's no rush. Yeah, you got to remember, right? You got to remember. So, so the real estate bubble has been really riding on the fact that the governments don't want to go into a recession. Right. So they're keeping interest really low. And that's really brought up, you know, property values. But you do know that if interest rates were to go up just 1%, there would be some huge callbacks on loans because what would happen is your property rates would drop, your cap rates would all drop, so the valuations would drop and you'd be over leveraged on the property. So you'd have to put some money in. And a lot of guys don't have the money right now because everybody is saying, I have no money in the bank. Why would I keep money in the bank? I'm getting 0.0 nothing for it. 
So I might as right. well just buy, 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 right? I'm a big believer that you got to keep at least 10% of your annual liquid at all times. I mean, put it in something that gives you nothing, but it's okay. Because when COVID-19 hits, you got the money. And but Vincenzo, so I just want to talk to, like, to the average person. So you're saying if what, like you earn a hundred thousand dollars, you need to have ten thousand dollars in the account. Is that like I just want to kind of get yeah, a something, yeah, something like okay. that. For example, okay. you see, okay. like okay. in our case, my movie theater business yeah. generates about sixty million dollars a year. So I I always keep six million dollars of liquidity. Okay. You know, and 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 it's there. It's just there. And when something happens, it's there. <laughs> I have it instead of. Oh, but Christ, I just bought that property now. Yeah, but I don't get it. You bought the property, but now I want to go, you know, so i give you an example. I was on a call with some investors um, in the movie business. And one of the, one of the other guys that was there is a very big um, South of the United States uh, uh, movie circuit. And he says to me, he says, uh, you know, we've been really lucky because we, we own all of our properties. We've got zero debt. So, yeah, we're shut down, but, you know, we think we're, we're going to be okay, right? He goes, plus, you know, we've approached our bank and they're willing to lend us some money or whatever. So I said to him, I says, look, you're a privileged guy, but I think you're, you're doing it wrong. And he says, what do you mean? So you've got no debt on your property. He goes, no. So you're going to go leverage 50% of your property right now so he owns about, I would say, it was about $200 million of property. So I go, you're going to go get yourself $100 million because right now the banks will give you the $100 million. Right. And you're going to pay the interest and you're going to be happy because six months from now, when you're going to want $10 million, they won't give them to you. Because six months in, if we're still at this game, banks are going to get nervous. Because, okay, no, now, now, it's, now we're going to hit that super – Depression, not not recession, right? It's yeah, a, let's just let's just hope we stay in a recession, right? Like I mean, that's right. the best case scenario, right? There now. There you yeah. go, right? So, yeah. so that's where the situation is, right? The situation is at the end of the day, cash is king, liquidity is king. So you want to be liquid, and that liquidity. Now we know it's probably the first time in our lifetime and in a long lifetime that the governments have said, you may not really have to pay rent. Anyway, the courts are shut, so nobody can throw you out of your apartment. Don't pay rent, right? So that means that the guy who used to say, real estate is the surest bet in the world because the money's going to come in every month. Well, you see, it's not coming in this month, right? So you must always keep some liquidity. That is important. I love that. Like the pay yourself mentality, right? Yeah. It, 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 it means so much now because... If, if you don't have the habit of saving $10 out of 100, and maybe you can speak to this because you're, you're in that upper echelon, Vincenzo, where like if, if, if someone doesn't have the habit of saving $10 out of, a, out of $100, you probably ain't going to save $6 million out of $60 because you don't have and that that's where, yeah, you know, And that's where the issue is. Uh, it, it, you must do it that way. And like I said, I mean, you know, everybody, who looked at my bank account would say, but like, seriously, I don't know, I buy a stock, buy, you know, yeah. buy some bonds, do something. Yeah. yeah. And what happens when I got, when I needed really liquid well, yeah. bonds are liquid. Yeah. And I'm going to lose 20% of my capital on it. Yeah, sure. That's a, that's not the hell of a liquid that it's a hell of, you know, like, no, <laughs> leave it in my bank account. I'm yeah. safe there. You know, yeah. it's safe. Underneath the pillow is good enough too. Like, as long as you know it's there. <laughs> that's <laughs> right. You know, and that's, and those are the things that you need to, you know, you don't have to panic. You don't have to obsess over it to the point that it blocks you from functioning. But you need to know that, yeah, you, you, something could happen to you. You could cross the street and get hit by a car. Okay. So does it mean you never cross the street again? No, it just means you're careful when you cross the street. But, Look so, both ways. Yeah. That's right. So now we've, 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 we're in the middle of COVID-19. Chances are we're going to have a COVID-20, maybe even a COVID-21. So we know. So let it be known before we get COVID-35, yeah. put some money aside, 
make yeah. sure you know that things uh, are what they are by local you let's know let's be prepared try right? and be let's... self-sufficient you know those are the things we got to try and do now talk to us about uh what's happening with dragon's den right now obviously it's on a little bit of a hiatus i guess when does the next well no so start? What, what, what happened is we were supposed to film in april okay. then it was moved to june and okay. now we're filming in august okay um and so that means that i mean if they film in august i would probably say then that i think the season's gonna start uh probably in january of next year so season guys, 15 uh, will be a january beginning in my opinion did you guys consider having all you on like maybe a zoom like this and just people doing it digitally and virtually or is that not no i don't think no i don't think it works i don't think it works <laughs> as uh, uh you know, the nice thing about doing it that way is Arlene wouldn't upset me as much because, you know, she's right next to me on the show and she drives me crazy all the time. But, you know, so maybe with the Zoom, I could actually, actually mute her and, you know, I get her off my, you know, my, my visuals or whatever. But, you know, uh, but either way, you know, that some of us, have, you know, some of us have been uh, not sick, but I mean, uh, uh, you know, um, um, uh, Elaine has had his bout with COVID-19, so... You know, it, it would have prevented even a Zoom thing. I mean, I really, I don't want to see, I don't want to see Lane when he's not doing well. I sure as hell don't want to see him when he's COVID-19, okay? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah. but, uh, and so, no, and I, and I think that ultimately, you know, one of the, one of the keys when we invest in these uh, companies is to get the feedback of, uh, of the, of the, uh, uh, of the guy who's doing the pitch. Right. But also, you have to remember that a lot of the pitches last an hour and then they chop ah. them down to okay. a 15 minute pitch. Right. I didn't know it lasted that long. Okay. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. 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 So somebody comes in there, they pitch you guys for about an hour and then, and yeah. then what we see is, 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 about, is, is the 15 minute minutes of the best parts. Yeah. Got it. So Got in it. other words, in other words, instead of beeping me, they just cut out the, oh. when I get really upset, you know, the, <laughs> Yeah. In other words, the screaming match between Arlene and I usually gets cut off. You know what I mean? I was actually just at a conference with Arlene. I didn't get to cross paths. I went on stage a couple of hours before she did. Um, yeah, yeah. But but you guys have a lot of you, it shows on screen. Like I, I I really love all the con like the connection that you guys all have yeah. with each other. Um, yeah. What is it that you're looking for from a dragon's perspective? Like from your perspective specifically, Vincenzo, are you investing more into the horse or the jockey? Like the business or the, the jockey. person? The, jo it's the okay. person is the jockey that I want. It's a, you know, the best example I can give you is um, the, uh, if you remember the Rudy Ladd pitch, I think it was season 14. It was a t-shirt business. Yes. Uh, and, and so Paul, uh, Paul and I closed that deal. Paul's a partner of mine now, you know, and, and we run that company together. Uh, so for me, what impressed me, I mean, you know, they're printed t-shirts. That's not, that's not going to impress me. Right. But what impressed me was the guy was able to get Bono to take his cartoon character and film it. The guy was able to go and get UFC people, uh, 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 boxers, uh, 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 world-renowned athletes, to wear his T-shirt, this is you know Paul's uh, is uh, is a uh, is a uh, is a guy from Montreal. He's got a full-time job. Uses this as a as a side hustle. You know how he opened up the doors to those connections for me was unbelievable. The right. other thing that's very very important is sometimes the product's so good that you want to do the deal, but then you look at the person and you say. This person won't listen. This person is not coachable. This person is not going to learn anything. Like, it's going to be a total waste of time with this person. At the end of the day, you know, the company will become cash trapped and I'll probably buy it for five cents on the dollar. So I'll still have the amazing product, but I, I, I don't even want to deal with this guy. Like, I don't want to deal with somebody like this. For the How next are you making months. that decision, though? How are you making that decision? Like, are you, are you just are you, experience? Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, one of the ultimate tools you develop is your ability to connect with people, right? So I don't know if you remember, there was a guy who, who was pitching a, it's the weirdest thing. It was, an, it was sort of like a, an online 
uh, uh, articling uh, kind of a, a platform where you would okay. sign up and you could get job experience, but it was for free and so forth. And everybody I, I was trying. That. Yeah, but and everybody was trying to explain to him that it was borderline illegal because people were working for free type of thing. And Got he it. was just like, "You guys don't get it." Got nobody. <laughs> You know what we do get is that it's my money and you need a million bucks of my money. So if I'm too stupid to understand your idea, chances are you're either not explaining it right or I don't want my money to go to you, right? So, and that's so sometimes the arrogance is that clear. There was another pitch where there was a girl, I think she developed a popcorn line. What okay. was very interesting with her is that she had gone, um, so she went to jail and she was doing a lot of, uh, now motivational speaking and I know and, uh, uh, cons and kernels. That's right, right. Emily so, yes, that's right. And so I made her a deal. So she came up on, you know, she came up in the den with some guy. And so when I asked them, "You guys dating or something?" Nope. Okay. Uh, what? what uh, so you guys partners? Nope. So what are you doing here? No, I'm just here with her. Like, I'm just, you know, like. I'm mm. watching the show. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I saw it. So I looked at it. So I made her a deal. And I said to her, I make you a deal. We'll become partners, you and I. But I'm going to give you more money than you came for. Take the money and get rid of that guy. I don't know what he's doing here. He's just getting me nervous. Like, I don't, I don't understand why. It, it just doesn't make sense to me what he's doing. And the whole key, the whole key. This wasn't on air, but the whole key was after she refused my deal, she left and whatever, whatever. Jim turned around to me and said, you know, you're smart on the call you did getting rid of the guy. And I said, yeah, no, I know. He goes, you know, he goes, a few years back, I made a deal with a woman. And I didn't bother asking, or at least, you know, I sort of like, you know, that's your husband. Yeah, it's my husband, but he's not involved in the business. So forth. He said, from day one, I was dealing with him more than with her. But I, I, I became partners with you, not with him. Like, why you, like, why am I, you know? And so my whole problem was I just couldn't understand what he was doing there. It's like, why are you here? Right? So there was two issues. If he was there as moral support, well, then I'm partnering up with somebody who, who's needy. Who, who need, and now, and now, and now we have a problem. I, I have time to give you. I'll give you my cell. You can come whatever you want. But man, if you're needy, I already have a wife. I don't need a boyfriend or a girlfriend here to, like, you know, be I got needy. five kids. I, yeah, got, I got five, five kids. kids. There you go, right? So I don't uh, – and vice versa, the last thing I want is to talk to you and then you go consult with somebody else, this guy, who's going to contradict or demotivate you to do what I want to do with you. or You know, so, so you know, in other words – uh, uh, the best partnerships I've had are, are between two people. Uh, three people doesn't really work that well with me sometimes. So, how, how much? Like you just you just mentioned something. I don't I don't know how much you can share, Vincenzo. So if I'm overstepping boundaries, let me know, please. But you mentioned like okay, you can have my cell phone number to, to somebody that you partner up with. On yeah. like how much? How involved are you afterwards? Is that different so every? I, I get so I get very involved. So my team comes in. You know, so it's my accountants who usually handle the stuff. We usually, what happens is we usually pick up all of the boring stuff. So all of the accountability, all of the accounting, all of the, you know, GST, QST, all of that stuff, right? So we handle all of that stuff. That gives me two things. It allows me on a, on a monthly basis to see how things are going easily uh, without even have to call you. I, I like that. The Give me the sales. Yeah. How's it going? Why did we spend money on this? Why did we do it this or whatever, whatever? So when I go into that meeting with my partner, he's aware, right? Okay. But for example, he can call me when he wants. He, you know, he, he had an enlightening moment. One of the advice I give all my partners is get yourself a pad and a pen. Put it on your bedside table. If at four in the morning you get up and you have an idea, right, just write it down because by eight o'clock you'll forget it. So write it down and then so you can call me at eight o'clock and tell me what the idea was and we can work on it. That's the... I yeah. love that. I love that. Now, if there's someone watching or listening and, and, and they have an idea and, and either like a product or a service and they're going to get a chance to be in front of you, what's, yeah. what should they be like? How do they prepare themselves? Like 
it, it, it to make it a close of a slam dunk for them as possible. Well, you know, the biggest, I, let me put it to you this way. I'll tell you what the yeah. biggest mistake. Okay. That people make when they go into the den. So they walk in and they forget that we deal with banks on a regular basis. So when they walk in and they want to try and sort of give us this impression that they're giving me a gift, they're doing me a favor. Like I sit there and say, like, you do know, right, that I know that you've gone to see every single bank under the sun and they've all said no to you, right? That's why you're coming to me. Okay. So now that we're at that level there, can we at least have the respect that you're not going to talk to me like I'm an idiot? And like, come on. Like, everybody, in other words, the best, the best, the first thing you need to know is who you are and where you're sitting. Once you know the seat you're sitting on, you can now maneuver to try and get out of that seat and up your seating arrangements, right? Or up your, your seating uh, ranking. But if you think you're going to come in and tell me, I'm going to make you a millionaire. Uh, you're late. That's done already. <laughs> like, give me something <laughs> I don't have. Right? Like, come on. <laughs> but believe it or not, and, and, and a lot of people seem to forget that our deals are conditional on a due diligence, right? Because I don't have, I don't have anything in there that tells me that you really have ten million of sales or not. Right. So you can right. say whatever you want. Right. But you lie to me, you're done. Because I'm going to tell you, buddy, you lie. You know, like I have somebody who, who's, I asked them, what's your, you know, how much revenue, how much money, how much revenue did you make? Yeah, and you have to remember that some of these questions were season, my season one was the right. first few pitches. I didn't realize I had to be a little more clear in my question. In other words, I didn't realize I had to say, what's your revenue in the last 12 months? Ah. Like for me, when a <laughs> bank asks me, what's your revenue? You want to know what my revenue was the last 12 months? And like, 2019, I know the number like this. Yeah. But yeah. so I tell somebody, what's your revenue? And they tell me 2 million bucks. I'm like, fuck, that's good. 2 million bucks is really good. Yeah. I'm impressed. Right? So right. now I'm looking at this. For me, it makes sense, right? Yeah. When I do the due diligence, it's $2 million over 10 years. Uh. <laughs> it didn't work out quite the way I wanted it to work out, right? So that's where the whole... Slight rounding is. error. Just a slight rounding error. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, oh. you know, but, but, and it's okay because people, they just, you know, they want to, they think they're there to pizzazz and wazazz me with the numbers. The truth of the matter is you got to get your numbers straight, but you can't. Like, for example, when I did the Rudy Ladd deal, right. I asked him, what are your sales? And he said, 12000 bucks. I still made the deal. So think about it. You know, like, like a lot of people need to realize that you telling me you, you're bringing in a $20 million business, when in reality, it's only a $2 million business per year, you're actually going to piss me off instead of, versus another guy told me 12000 bucks. And I actually did the deal with him because it's, I said, yeah, wow, you know, the guy's actually telling me the truth. I'm yeah. impressed. Yeah. You know, like, I got a guy that I can trust. You know that they're going to, the, the, the dragons get an opportunity to do due diligence. Like, you're almost yeah. better off being slightly conservative. Like, it's 12 right. million, say 11 million, 800,000. And when they yeah. see it, it's like, oh, you actually made 12, uh, yeah. uh, Jazz. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. yeah. So, um, Vincenzo. We've been doing this for an hour and 15 minutes. It's felt like 10 minutes. Um, I'm so appreciative of your time. I need you to, and I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot, but it's not like you're afraid of the camera. Um, what is the one tip or one strategy for, for my listeners from either a, a uh, mindset perspective, something tactical for them to take from this episode today? I tell you, look, I said this many, many, many years ago. I was still a very young pup in my early 30s. And I was on stage with some of the richest people in, uh, in, uh, in Quebec. Some of the Quebec Inc. guys that, you know, today are friends. Uh, actually, I should say half of them on that stage were, are today friends. The other half I don't talk to. Um, and I said to, I said to everybody there, and I said, you know, guys, you see all of these rules these guys are talking about? See political correctness, etiquette, this, that, that, that. And everybody, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you do realize those are barriers to entry, 
created by these guys so that you guys can't annihilate them, right? So take the rule book that they're talking about, put it in the drawer and tell them, I don't need your rules. There is no rules in business. At the end of the day, you know, the spoils go to the victor. So do what you got to do. As long as it's legal in the sense, you know, legal, do what you got to do. Uh, um, you know, greed is good. Hate on a, on a competitive nature is good. You know, I mean, I went to a school that hated a rival school. I then went to CJEP, which is your grade 12, 13, and I was at school with some of those guys, and the rivalry was finished. But during those years in high school, that hate fueled the competitiveness. It, 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 you know, it made you go places that you never thought you could go. So the, the greatness of humanity is its flaws. And that's, that's, you know, anybody who can take a personal flaw and make money off it, that means that's, that's a success story, right? Because see, you know, my weakness as being an only child, my, my, my fear of, it made me more aggressive, made me even more a go-getter, made me more fearless, right? And like I said, all of these rules, you know, I, I, too many times I bump into people who say to me, that's not the way things are done here. Well, I guess it's time to change the rules, isn't it? Well, and just, you know, take your rule book, throw it down the street. I don't care. Like, it's, you know, somebody once told me, you know, we don't do this uh, this way. It's time to update your rules, guys. It's 2020. <laughs> yeah, let's go, man. You know, we're not in 18-something anymore. You know, I'm going to golf with this attire, whether you like it or not. See you later. You know, get with the program type of thing, right? And that's where ultimately it is. So I would tell, you know, I think the best, uh, the best advice I can give you is there are no rules. You, you, you make your own rules. And, you know, if, if you got to call somebody 20 times, call them 20 times. If somebody says, yeah, but, you know, you're harassing me. Yeah, I know. So just, I'm, anyway, it doesn't matter. I got my call. I, I finally got you on the phone. You get it done, you know, type of thing. Vincenzo. Thank you, thank you, thank, thank you. you for having me. I, 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 for having I can't me and say, whatever you want, you let me know. I'll be back. I oh, that really means a lot to me. My viewers and my listeners are gonna appreciate this so much. Um, thank you for 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 doing deals with people. You know, you're giving people thank opportunity you. out there. Yeah. Um, and then and then you come onto my podcast and and I've seen you do so many interviews. Um. It really means a lot because because it, it shows people it doesn't matter what background you come from you can do it yourself as well. Yeah, yeah. I think Thank it's very you. important. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you very much, guys. Be safe. This has been the REC Experience Podcast with Jazz Takar, an REC Canada production. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching and listening. Please, please take a second right now to subscribe and follow us on whatever podcast platform you're watching or listening. It means the world to me. Thank you.